This conference will now be recorded. So good morning all of you guys. Today's topic is pediatric HIV infection. So there is something special about the last year when I was asked to take this class because for nearly 10 years I was away from a country and the place where I was living no HIV at all. In fact they never used to give visas if the patient is turned positive. So in a way I was a little diffident in taking up a class on pediatric HIV because we were not treating them and exactly there for that purpose I wanted to learn and I went through several of the latest recommendations and what is up to date. So most of the content that I'm presenting today is very authentic and it's a final actually in a way. So you can see it and just So why it, what is about the little epidemiological factors about the HIV? All of you are aware. People living with HIV, 37.9 million globally, and out of them, 23.3 million are receiving antiretroviral therapy. Every year, there is 1.7 million people newly diagnosed with HIV especially the adolescents, nearly 22% of all new HIV infections are in the adolescent group. And 81% of youth cases occurring in young males who have sex with males. Which is means males having sex with males. With the new developmental trends. And 8% of the cases of AIDS also occur in this age group. It is actually HIV positive alone is not that. AIDS is actually disease. So these are the general features as for the UNAIDS. Such is the high relevance of the topic. Now, what about in India? The situation in India, if you see, the third largest HIV epidemic in the world is in India. Nation adult HIV prevalence rate in 2015 is 0.26%. Slightly male preponderance is 0.3% in males and 0.2% in females. And people living with HIV in India itself is 21 lakhs. And children account for 6.5% of them. So such is the high prevalence of the HIV. You can see this adult prevalence rate from the HIV in 1990 to 2017. Uh, this is the estimations for 2017 by NACO, National AIDS Control Organization. You can see the topmost in the list is Mizoram, 2.04% of the population is the highest prevalence, followed by Manipur and then Nagar. Northeast countries are notorious for this. In the mainland of the India, Telangana has got a highest 0.7%. We are only next to the Telangana. The Andhra states, the Telugu states are very leading almost in this. There is a, unfortunately, in the uh, prevalence rates of HIV. And Tamil Nadu is a national average 0.22. So, so overall national average also 0.22% is the prevalence. So these are the prevalence figures of people's HIV prevalence. Here, before I go into this, how exactly HIV is there, we must better have an idea of how the infection is happening in the pathogens of HIV. Just we'll have a look at this video first. Virus, meaning that it has an outer envelope and in the center, it has two Can copies of RNA, as well as an enzyme here in blue that's reverse transcriptase, which will ultimately turn that RNA. Guys, can you hear the sound? Yes, sir. Okay. 
into DNA. Um, the, the virus itself, with this outer envelope protein, uh, actually directly infects T helper cells. The way that it does this is that as it comes up to the cell surface, it uses receptors that are on T helper cells and exclusive to T helper cells, which are CD4 molecule, which really defines T helper cells. It's a surface receptor that binds to the envelope protein. It, that causes a conformational change and allows a second receptor to grab hold of the envelope. This is the chemokine co-receptor. It's also called CCR5. This is very, very important because please note down the chemokine receptors because they one of the latest target organ, the target place where the anti-HIV drugs are being manufactured. And we'll talk about that more. What happens now is that the, the, the stock of the envelope protein pierces through the, uh, from the virus into the, into the host cell and starts to draw the two cell membrane, the cell membrane and the viral membrane together. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases the viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome, and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane and at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for <coughs> translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. That's done by an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. Once that happens now, the cell can produce tons of viruses, and this is really what then keeps the whole process going. That in nutshell, guys, did you see what is the mechanism or mystery you might have seen? 
So what it shows is there are several stages you might have noticed actually right from the time of attaching to the T cell, CD4 cell, and then at the entrance, after entering the reverse transcriptase enzyme to produce a DNA out of RNA, each enzyme of these actually, there is a target uh, points for the development of the drugs. So when we are talking about the HIV drugs, please you may have to recollect all these things, Integra integration and ultimately the proteases, which is, you know, breaks into the large proteins into the different size of proteins. So all these stages, we may get drugs for this because so the genome proteins you have seen different types of it. so envelope proteins are there and various enclosing proteins are also there so this is just for idea sake HIV consists of nine genes and three structural genes six non-structural genes these are regulatory genes structural genes are envelope ENV GAG and PO that is envelope gag protein Paul protein and regular regions are TAT, REV, NEF, VIF, PPR, BU, PU. This, you need not have to remember all these things. Only thing is just idea. So this is how the structure, so many proteins are being along with the virion. TAT means transactivator transcription. REV stands for regulator of virion, virion protein expression. NEF means negative regulatory factor. Virion infectivity factor, viral protein U, viral protein R. This, these are all the various subproteins. So, undergraduates, we are not asking you all these questions, just for your understanding. Now, how is it transmitted? Let us have the, the modes of transmission, all of you are familiar. Now, the commonest being the vertical transmission, especially pediatrics is concerned, mother to child transmission, all of you know, it, it may happen even when the baby is inside the womb, that is in the fetus, 20 to 30 percent. But most of the time, it is at the time of parturition. Two, during intrapartum, the transmission, because when the placenta gets separated, that is the time the blood mixing occurs, actually. As long as the placenta is there, it holds good. And postpartum, after delivery also, there is a possibility, because 18 percent of women established in, with the established infection, 29 to 50 percent women who acquire HIV postnatally, because this is more common with the already infected mothers, but even the mother is not infected at the time of delivery, she got infected later on, but she can also transmit the vision, that is to the breast manufacturer. So the blood products, three to six percent. In pediatrics, we very, the proportion of the blood transmission is very, very less. And of course, there is a child abuse because the sexual transmission per se is not so common in children, but it can happen still through the process of child abuse. And usage of unsafe print prick needles, unsafe needles, shops, and intravenous drug usage, especially in adolescent. So that possibility also is there, which is that common. So these are the various five modalities that you can have, a child can have in pediatric HIV transmission, how they can acquire infection. So just remember these five factors. Now, according to your book, WHO, the clinical feature, how do they manifest? So they are divided into five categories. The first, stage one is asymptomatic. The child is perfectly almost only in the clinical situation because the mother is positive, we suspect the child may be having. So you only then check it, then that's all. So there is a possibility on persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, except for that child is completely normal. That is called the stage one. The next stage is unexplained persistent hepatosplenomegaly because if you know whenever there is hepatosplenomegaly in child you look for the causes so we have got so many causes in infective causes non-infective causes like that if you rule out all one by one one by one, malaria tuberculosis actually where is congestive heart failure various cirrhosis liver all these things one by one you ruled out still there is hepatosplenomegaly unexplained because at that stage there may not be any symptoms at all so that is stage two papular pruritic eruptions Fungal nail infections, usually fungal infections in the mouth is okay. Nail infections are unlikely. Angular chelitis, you know, just you must, first think it, you must think it is a vitamin deficiency, a riboflavin deficiency, but still these are the things you make you think of possibility. Lineal gingival erythema, that is gingival means lips becoming vertical lines along the 
extensive what virus infection what some times children do get but extensive what make you think or it may be molluscum contagious it looks like a what only it's like a vesicular papular lesions on the mucous membranes molluscum contagious viral infection recurrent oral ulcerations unexplained persistent parotid enlargement just like lymphadenitis parotid enlarged you roll out the mums you roll out other parotiditis causes but still there is a possibility is and notable is herpes zoster herpes zoster infections where it's mud whether it's genital or oral whenever it is there it is a possible indicator there may be underlying hiv recurrent chronic upper respiratory tract infections you know once in a way children do get it especially frequently that is an indication of uh, high immunosuppression and possible cause of hiv these are all the things in you know, a suspicious causes actually you cannot definite cases next stage 3 is already it has affected the child's nutrition malnourishment you rule out the possibility of nutritional deficiency or actually an inadequacy of the food and thing but child is not putting on weight unexplained persistent diarrhea we call the persistent diarrhea when the diarrhea is lasting more than 14 days so usually acute diarrhea lasts maximum 1 week so if it is lasting more than 2 weeks or a fever which is lasting fever means again 37.5 above and intermittent constant or longer than one month all these things are possibility of you think of an explained fever persistent oral candidiasis sometimes they do children do get candidiasis but if it lasting more than one and a half to two weeks two months it is something else. oral high hairy loci plaque there is a whitish yellow coating of the tongue presence of pulmonary tuberculosis especially in children all children with pulmonary tuberculosis you must think of possibility of underlying hiv because the only external manifestation be tuberculosis severe recurrent bacterial pneumonia bacterial pneumonia again just like in, within one week the persistent in the college when the radiological films are not cleared within one month usually uh, within one month either it takes if you don't treat it may go into complication otherwise it resolves and if any radiological change is not resolving one month is a bacterial persistent bacterial pneumonia unexplained anemia anemia here we define less than 8 grams or in neutropenia less than 1 lakh per pen and chronic thrombocytopenia less than 50000 so these are the sorry is not 1 or 9 10 to the power of 9 sorry so these are the possibilities of a third stage and the fourth stage is extra pulmonary tuberculosis when the tuberculosis has spread to the body the disseminated tuberculosis kaposi sarcoma esophageal candidiasis candida is not only confined to the mouth it is extended fungal infections are not, not so commonly we come across the cryptosporiasis toxoplasmosis outside the neonatal period is very very uncommon so these presence of these infections hiv encephalopathy altered sensorium convulsions all these things cytomegalovirus retinitis and same with infection affecting any other organ uh, after the age of 1 month because cmv is a uh, usually torch infections in mother is as it uh, adults it is silent only the fetal manifestation may be there but a child getting cmv infection after 1 month that is a an indication of immunodeficiency cerebral or b cell non hodgkin's lymphoma you know hodgkin lymphoma sir hodgkin's non hodgkin lymphoma so non hodgkin lymphoma especially involved in the b cell type they are classified into t cells lymphomas and b cell lymphomas so especially the b cell lymphoma especially affecting the central nervous system is also suggested okay so these are the four stages you think of possibilities actually depending on the existence of severe type immunodeficiency the staging is done by who now is there any immunological classification the table is given in your book actually all what you i would like to remember is this one in a forget about one is one month actually is below children above 5 years almost like adults it is a, any time the cd4 count cell is less than 200 or less than 15% of the wbc so these are the indication of a severe immunosuppression so mild moderate to severe actually are there this when there is a uh, my, the severity is the, the both the cd count is between 300 to 350 to 400 is mild And 200 to 300 is advanced, and anything less than 200 is a definite indication of a severe immunosuppression. That much you remember. The yes, younger ages you need not worry. Now, the nobody is going to ask you pediatric HIV essay. 
So the question is, in the examination point of view, I want to develop this talk as a examination point of view. So you may be asked in a different, different aspects. And once you go, to go through this lecture, you must be prepared to write any of these, either in the form of a short note or essay, whatever it is, you must be able to write it. So what are all the components which PHAV care is concerned? So I divided into eight possibilities. We'll discuss in each one. So what is the immediate care of the baby? Any difference in the normal child and HIV child? So that is the first and foremost we'll see as the HIV baby is there. So the immediate care, the definite modifications are the baby's mouth and nostrils should be wiped as soon as heard is tell because that is the oral cavity is one of the mode of administration because the liker may be having something so it should not go into the babies. So I said most of the transmission occurs at the time of delivery. So the only dry areas are actually the umbilicals and the mouth. So the infant should be handled with gloves until all blood and maternal secretions have been washed. This is more of a protection for yourself rather than the baby. Initiate within one first hour of birth feeding according to the preferred informed choice. Feeding can be started. We'll start the choice means we'll talk about this. The cord should be clamped soon after birth. Usually the delayed clamping is not advisable. Usually we give 30 seconds minimum. So you see now, even that is not advisable. HIV positive mothers, better to cut the clamp, clamp when the child is delivered, better to clamp the umbilicus and the possible mode of transmission new changes in it. So early cutting of the cord, uh, the cord and early cleaning of the mouth and handling with always with your gloved hands and feeding. Early feeding you can do. And there is one more thing, never never been prophylaxis. We are talking more about that later on. These are the differences with the normal baby delivery and the HIV baby delivery. Next, the topic I is talking is the infant feeding. What about the feeding? Can mother breastfeed the baby? So these are the suggestions. The current national guidelines for feeding of HIV exposed and infected infants. And then just exposure also is not an indication. Actually, mother may be positive, child is not infected, or child may be infected less than six months of age. This is IMCA complementary course in HIV AIDS module three, counseling of HIV positive mother according to WHO. So what they do sell is exclusive breastfeeding for six months of the life still, even if the mother is positive. That is a WHO recommendation. Examination, you have to write this only. But this you do after properly informing the parent about the possibility of a transmission. There is a definite extra possibilities there. So there is a 15% chance of additional uh, possibility of transmission through breast milk. So what if, if the parents decide not to feed, then exclusive replacement feeding, the alternative is, is called as exclusive replacement feed, considering only situation where breastfeeding cannot be done and upon the individual mother's choice and provided the six criteria of the replacement feeding are meant. So because we know all the dangers of the artificial feeding. So what are the six criteria to assess suitability of a replacement feeding instead? It must be, they must be having a safe water and sanitation assured. Caregiver can reliably afford to provide sufficient sustained replacement feeding because you know, you give one month and then the, okay, we cannot purchase damn milk powder, sir, actually we cannot purchase milk, sir. Or something like they get tired of making a baby's mil milk in the middle of the night, I'm very difficult, I'm getting tired, sir. So not like that. If you are committed to that, exclusive, that's all. Caregiver can prepare frequently enough to clean in, in a clean manner because you must watch whether the baby's uh, my, my last time only I boiled, why unnecessarily this time boiling, all that type of attitude the parent is having definitely not fit for the artificial feeding advice. Exclusive give replacement feeding. No, you know, mornings I give, evenings I feed, not like that. It should be exclusive. And the family should be supportive. Not only the mother, father, all the grandparents, whoever it is there, they all should be on the same line and can access health care that offers comprehensive health. Suppose if there is any necessity, there must be somebody to advise the parent. The child is remote, mother is in a remote area, no access to the medical advice and she have to take decisions herself without her knowledge, proper knowledge. Such patients are not advisable. So these are the six criteria to assess the replacement feeding, all very important. So when the feeding for the HIV positive baby, that may be asked as a question, as a short note, sorry. Uh, essay. So 
FOS, you just remember this mnemonic, WHO recommendation for exclusive deployment. FOS means it should be acceptable, the, whatever the feeling that you are giving. And it's feasible, okay, they must have resources for the affordable resources. Feasible means that the, the logistics, they do have the logistics. Sustainable, continuously they should be able to give. And this safe way, because all the, all the precautions they should be able to take. So FOS, you remember, acceptable, feasible, affordable, sustainable, and safe. Then only WHO recommends infant feeding can be given artificial feeding. But one caveat, definitely not, this should not be done. HIV positive mothers should avoid mixing of feeding. That means sometimes I give breast milk, sometimes I give artificial milk. That is no, no. And no circumstances, mixed feeding is definitely no. You must be thorough and definitely you write down, underline that actually. Mixed feeding, never advisable. That is the most dangerous. These, these children will have the complications of both the HIV and complication of artificial feeding. That is the worst fair way. So if you give exclusive breastfeeding, even though there is a possibility of HIV transmission, you can give anti-retroviral therapy and then need to do something. So these are the feeding recommendations, just remember. Now the ARV prophylaxis, because can we prevent HIV transmission? Already transmitted or if it is not transmitted to the baby, because most of the transmission I said to the transfaturation. So estimated risk of timing of mother to child, mother to child, MTCT means mother to child transmission. So during pregnancy, only 5 to 10 percent. During labor and delivery, 10 to 15 percent. During 15 per breastfeeding, another 5 to 5 to 20 percent. So the overall risk without breastfeeding, if it is 15 to 25, overall risk with the breastfeeding definitely indicates more than 10 to 15 percent more than this one. That is what I wanted to say. So even without that, mother is baby is having this much of risk. But with breastfeeding, you are increasing to doubling it, almost 15 to 30. The overall risk with the breastfeeding to 18 to 24 months, that is even after the birth, because the child mother taking care of her and all these things, is totally 30 to 45 percent. This is the according to John. So these are the, if you remember all these percentages or not, you just remember this sentence. The breastfeeding adds extra 15 to 20 percent of risk, additional risk of transmission. So to prevent that, what should we do? This is an echo. National AIDS Control Organization, National PPCTC means parent to prevention of parent to child transmission. Prevention of parent to child transmission of HIV. So this is a four prongs PPCTC. One is primary prevention. That means HIV negative mother general population, uh, uh, adolescent, and the uh, repro reproductory child health services section. So through this, you know, uh, the mothers should be taken care of, or they must be informed about all the dangers that can happen, all these things. So prevent unintended pregnancies, HIV positive, non-pregnant, family planning counseling, uh, integrated uh, counseling centers, these are ICT centers that we call it as, more importantly, antiretroviral center. Through, through these centers, what they do, they approach the mothers and they tell her how to prevent the reason, how to, because the, the, the usage of condoms and actually preventive methods with how not to get infected. If the if husband is a positive, even the mother is, you can prevent the transmission to the mother through these services, actually. Prevention of mother to child, HIV positive and pregnant mothers, so these should be counseled. And even after the child delivered, HIV positive mother and child, they should receive support and treatment because only not only drugs and almost, most of the supporting psychological and logistical support. So through all these stages, these are the four pronged assistance through NACO programs are there. So these are the five phased PMCT. The, what are the programs are for? Phases are five. The first is family planning and sexual transmitted infection control and life skill teaching. That means ability to say no when the mother doesn't want to actually pregnancy, able to say no. So the expression that including their self-respect and also all these life skills, the 10 life skills, all of you know, the creative thinking, critical thinking, all these things are there. So for especially for adolescents, these are all important. So this is called the phase alpha, the prevention level. The second is antenatal care. ANC stands for antenatal checkups. And BCCT means voluntary confidential counseling and testing because you cannot 
go on testing parent anybody somebody comes to the whether hiv positive or not so voluntary means whenever they suspect the person the woman the parents they can bring that lady and get it checked because husband is positive he is a possibility sir they must come and they get checked early checking is always important so that you can do some medication or something so what can you do if you do diagnose early antiretroviral therapy and safe delivery safe delivery means cesarean section and actually under medical care and all these things again this is called the prophylaxis stage so antiretroviral therapy even when the mother is pregnant you can start it so then next stage is replacement feeds after the baby is well, we have just now spoke about what is replacement all the six uh, criteria are satisfied you can tell the first thing so six replacement feed is or exclusive breastfeeding ebf means exclusive breastfeeding not express breastfeeding here here it is exclusive so this is the infant feeding that you can prevent addition 15 percent of risk and the lastly pcpp means pneumocystis prevention uh, pneumocystis infection prevention prophylaxis this is for the babies especially uh, already positive mothers we'll talk more about this later on so the omega stage is prevention of the various secondary infections in the babies and social support and for the logistical support so these are the five phases of pmz if the question has comes on the how to prevent mother to child transmission pmz ct you must mention all these four five phases of uh, omega phase phase one information phase phase two prophylaxis phase phase three infant feeding and lastly phase of omega is support phase so if you can put this diagram also that is very very important i should try to remember these diagrams this is from the prevention of mother to child transmission to indian journal of medical research and uh, every information i am giving in the authentic information you need not have to doubt at all so pregnant woman prevention i said irv pre prevention in the acute labor because there is no prior treatment actually if the mother is there at this stage you can give irv therapy but you, when you are delivering the baby until then mother also doesn't know the such programs are there so you are in a situation like this so in such a situation what do you do so even at that time you can start entry intrapartum antiretroviral therapy even though mother is not taking earlier also so initiate the, these the coding drugs actually i will tell you later in the ending so the lamivudine 3t means lamivudine efavirenz and uh, stavudin one ia is integrase inhibitor nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor nrti nnrti is nu non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors these are the codings i will talk about this about the drugs later on one nrti one N nrti one integrase inhibitors or simply nevirapine alone can be started into the mother 200 mg first part from after the mother after the baby has delivered you continue mother with a zidovudin lamivudin and efavirenz for continuous mother and whatever necessary time is necessary for the baby also syrup nevirapine 2 mg per kg dose and the time of birth and daily until 6 weeks 6 weeks or 12 weeks we'll decide later on actually minimum 6 weeks actually we uh, want to decide i will tell later on. so these are the minimum things to prevent at the time of prevention there is anti retroviral prophylaxis how to you can prevent in time of delivery so for the baby arv prophylaxis for infant this is very very important slide especially this this may be asked as only short notes or small question how to prevent arv prophylaxis for the newborn baby infant should be started on a daily nevirapine prophylaxis at their first encounter with the health services suppose if you are at the delivery point you can start then itself or if the baby is brought to you after delivery somewhere outside the first time you see mother is positive and actually baby has delivered that means earliest possible time start nevirapine and then daily nevirapine prophylaxis can be started even if it is more than 72 hours later also that means nothing harm in better late than never so baby is brought to you on the third day even then chances are there you can prevent uh, mother to child transmission so how much nevirapine you give 2 mg per kg per day should be continued for a minimum of 6 weeks if the baby is on the replacement feeds so that means you are definitely exclusive replacement feeds please remember but if the mother wanted to give feeding then give at least minimum 12 weeks because i exclusive breastfeeding or exclusive replacement feeding i told you so if it is on the exclusive uh, replacement feeding Uh, in six weeks, but it's exclusive breastfeeding, twelve weeks. 
At 12 weeks, what you do? Then you do the testing whether the baby has a recorded infection or not. You have to, then you decide if, the, if you are still continue. If the positive, you have to still continue. That is the minimum time actually when you go for the testing. So this slide is important for the PPCTC parent to mother parent, that is mother to child transmission or parent to child transmission. So the next idea is immunization and vitamin E supplementation. The issue of immunizations. So can we give immunization vaccines for the baby? So this is the general recommendations. You see, all you know the immunosuppressed child should not receive live vaccines. All of you are familiar, isn't it? But at this stage, newborn baby, we do not know whether it is immunosuppressed or not. So moreover, BCG is a cell mediated immunity. So there is no harm in giving it all. So for all those people, BCG can be given safely, even though it is a live vaccine. <clears throat> should be given at birth. If not given at birth, should, and then better not to give because you do not know. Because at birth you can give. After that, there may be a viral, the immunosuppression has occurred. We do not know. Or definitely you should not give if it is a symptomatic child. If it is a symptomatic child, you should not give. No. So symptomatic child is contraindication. All live vaccines should not be given. Or if the CD4 count is less than 15%, or if the CD4 count is very good, then you can think of. Rotavirus is another live vaccine, but given orally, recommended for use in HIV exposed infants due to their vulnerability of diarrhea. This another live vaccine you can give. Lota and BCG are the two live virus vaccines you can give. Whereas polio, better to give. Now we got a killed vaccine is available, intramuscular vaccine. So better avoid oral polio vaccine. JE vaccine, wherever the conditions, because you know it has come into the national schedule also some areas, it is safe to be used. It is a killed vaccine. Hepatitis B, all of you know, it is a sub subunit vaccine. That's why it's not a contraindication. And because you are suspecting immunosuppression, you better give four doses. Double quantity schedule also recommended in some patients if they feel zero conversion is not there. So usually 5.5 ml, you give two doses of 0.5 ml. That is only alteration of hepatitis B. Vitamin E supplementation is very, very important. Should be given as per the national schedule. As per the national, that means at month of nine months you start, and then every you know, six months. So that is about the various immunizations. Now it is a cotrimoxyl prophylaxis. Why, where does it this come from? So all of you all know, these children are born for a opportunistic infections, especially pneumocystis carrying. So all HIV exposed infants should receive what is called as this uh, cotrimoxyl prophylaxis from the age of six weeks. So you avoid initial six weeks, actually you just leave it and then onwards you give cotrimoxyl prophylaxis. It protects from pneumocystic aerovisi, not only that, it also protects, they said it is also from malaria and diarrhea. And some fungal infections like isospora, cyclosporum, toxoplasmosis. So that is important to the cotrimoxyl. So effective proven strategy in reducing the morbidity and morbidity. The dose is 5 milligram per kg per day as a single dose. That is the dose. So this much, if you remember the cotrimoxyl prophylaxis, sometimes your question may be two marks question, cotrimoxyl prophylaxis in HIV. So why is it given to prevent it's a opportunistic infections like this? So, and how much dose is given? This much is given. When do you start? From the age of six months. This point, three points enough for the two marks, that's enough. Okay. Then growth and development. You know, all these children are affected by the uh, nutritional effect. So these are the recommendations. Monitoring of the growth and development is weight should be measured at every visit. Whenever a positive child is there, when they come for the immunization, we are measuring. Anyway, but even if the issue is brought for some other, you just keep monitoring the waiting. And length should be maintained at least once in three months. They should be documentedly. And you all should follow only WHO reference standards. You know, all the charts are very familiar. And also, not only growth, you must monitor the cognitive, motor, language, and social skills. All this, you know, the four domains of the developmental maintenance, generally keep monitoring them and actually suggest mother in the remedial measures if at all. Now, the most important is one aspect is early infant diagnosis. Well, if you know, 
how to diagnose this i did i just avoided this one because there are inbuilt problems in diagnosing positive whether the child has got infected or not we do not know maternal hiv antibodies transmit passively to the infant during the pregnancy so they persist in the 9 to 12 months so if you study only antibodies it is not diagnostic at all because no rapid test of hiv for newborns because the those antibodies as passively transmitted antibodies are actively developed in the baby you do not know so when do they disappear all these iggs that transmitted from the mother they last up to 6 to 9 months or in sometimes in 12 months also so any antibody test is useless there is a main limitation here the more reliable indicators are hiv infection or status of the infants uh, test rna and antigen viral and rna and viral antigens should be tested the presence of iga and igm antibodies because this is much more specific actually you know but still the tests the assays are very very erratic non specific so we are in a way uh, limited in our resources actually so only when we remain is rna positive recommended virological test are if the mother is of low risk mothers received antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy or a confirmed hiv rna level well below the titers actually and no concern limit related to the maternal adherence suppose you have given the medication antiretroviral mother, mother is you are sure that mother has taken all through the pregnancy but those high risk people are actually those people who cannot rely on them mothers achieved those mothers who did not receive antiretroviral therapy at all during pregnancy and they would who did not receive antiretroviral drugs during parturition at the time of delivery and very late if, if at all they started on antiretroviral drugs very late only so and diagnosis of acute hiv infection and detectable hiv loads is very high antiviral loads all these become the high risk people so your approach to them is different in low risk and high risk so what to do the recommended viral testing this that is nucleic acid testing has to be keep on, kept on doing to see whether the mother baby has deceived them or not for low risk people so you can do the test after two to three weeks of the delivery because at the time we can do reliably baby has just settled down so for high risk even at birth you should do and keep on doing it at two to three weeks for the low risk people once you do at two to four three weeks if they come negative again do it four to eight weeks again four months to six months if by six months at least the positivity develops if the child is infected you can be able to die. only difference with the high risk people are one additional test at time of delivery itself birth itself and between four and ten weeks you have to do two tests one here one two, two times you have to check this. that is the difference low risk people only three and for high risk people one two three four five times you have to do nucleic acid testing that is the strategy suggested by the NACO now these are the diagnostic test NACO recommender diagnosis DNA PCR test on a dried blood sample see at the two weeks of age actually right DBF you call it the dried blood sample detect viral DNA for the diagnosis of HIV-1 infection during infancy so this is the DBF test first of all then the test is performed at six weeks of age at the earliest or earliest opportunity because if the child come to you at eight weeks then do it early until the 18 months of age you can go on doing even the because child has see you are seeing the child only at the age of 10 months then only you came to know even then let's do it actually and then at the six months of age dna pcr must be performed after screening for hiv antibodies here even though you have done antibody studies because your antibodies are very unreliable six months babies all these even low risk babies also you have to do dna pcr test breastfed children on uh, we can exclusive breastfed children uh, there is ongoing risk of hiv transmission so they are again tested six weeks first after completion of the breastfeeding and reliably to exclude HIV infection because once mother stopped weaning, started weaning so she said now I'm, I'm not giving at all then again better to do whether you during this period of plus feeding whether mother has transmitted this or not so so many frequency DNA tests are necessary so remember these are the frequency suggested by NACO now there are early interest diagnosis there are two tests that are available one is DNA PCR and RNA PCR 
So both are almost equal. Sensitivity and specificity of both tests are very, very almost same. So for all practical purposes, most commonly available is the DNA PCR test. Uh, it, it is done on a DNA dried blood film, whereas RNA PCR done on a plasma. That is the only difference. So this gives a quantitative RNA PCR gives quantitative information also. So that is you can even assess the viral load also. That is an additional advantage with RNA PCR, but not so commonly available. So for all practical purposes, you can do DNA PCR. That is about the testing. Now we don't have the DNA test also. There is no virological testing in the resource limited country. Our extrapolation mother doesn't have the money. So even in that stage, you can suspect the severity of HIV disease based on this. This is the clinical criteria of presumptive diagnosis of severe HIV infection are based on this. With two or more of the following. One is oral thrush or a severe pneumonia or severe sepsis. Out of these three, any two are there, you can suspect HIV positive. Recent HIV related maternal death, mother has died because then you must suspect the mother baby is having a very severe risk of it. Advanced HIV disease in the mother, almost having a Kaposi sarcoma, all these things, the advanced stages, multi system involvement, all these things, encephalopathy. So there is a possibility baby is also having severe infection. And the CD4 count, again, I said 15 to 20 percent minimum, all such things are serious infections. Without even PCR test, you can say this baby is having severe immunosuppression HIV infection. So these are the whenever you are talking about the diagnosis of HIV in a baby, newborn, in a baby infant. So you must immediately test what are the testing strategies, PCR test, when to do, uh, how frequently you have to do all those things and what are the types of PCR tests are available, DNA and RNA. And then in the absence of this diagnostic test also, these are the possibilities. If the, any of these clinical scenarios resembling this, you can suspect this that is a diagnosis aspect. Now, guys, we come to the last of the follow-up, actually. Follow-up of these things, you have this, how, do, how frequently you have to do, what are the things. So, these are done at the Integrated Counseling and Testing Center. ICTS means Integrated Counseling and Testing Centers are established under the PNACO programs. So, what they do, first they check the nutrition, like anthropometry, every, every time the baby visits, you have to measure the nutritional growth, the retardation has occurred, actually, what remedies have to be done. Then clinical assessment, history and physical examination, because we need recent histories of any infections, diarrhea, and cough, all these things, all these you see. You then do the physical examination of the babies regularly to see whether there is infection signs are there. You do the developmental assessment, DQ assessment, whether where the gross motor, fine motor, social adaptive speech, and all these things. How are they doing on well? Minimum labs are then happy HP percent, complete urine examinations, complete blood picture and CD4 count when and if and whenever necessary because you have to see which will be less than age dependent count proportions are there or not. And psychosocial assessment, overall health because what is the psychological support whether the baby getting too much stimulation and actually psychological support or not. These are the things. Basic five aspects that is to be sent, tested at every ICD, ICTC. So what are the follow-up care you have to suggest by it means you have to mention all these five parameters at ICTC centers. Now, lastly, we go for antiretroviral drugs because I, so far I didn't speak about antiretroviral drugs. Babies also can get antiretroviral drugs. So just before going to that, I'm just recommend recollecting the previous video I have shown you. So you see the, the first on the left, you see the fusion stage because where the virus comes and the uh, nuclear membranes of this viral membrane and cell membrane fusion. This is called the stage of fusion. There are drugs which inhibit at this stage, this fusion inhibitor drugs. Remember that. So when the RNA has gone inside, so it starts developing the DNA. This is to the enzyme called as a reverse transcriptase. So if you can stop this reverse transcriptase enzyme, so that is another stage you can have drugs. So genomic RNA, again, double stranded DNA is coming actually from the DNA. So at this stage also you can stop it, reverse transcripts inhibitors. And the double stranded DNA has come from the, and this gets integrated with the, the enter the nucleus. So through the process of integration. So once you entered the cytoplasm to nucleus, the proviral RNA. So this is got into the, this is a host DNA and got integrated, you see here. So this problem can be stopped, integrase inhibitors. 
and then after transcription viral proteins are given as i said in large proteins are there these proteins are to be processed by enzyme called as protease so protease inhibitors here this stage also you can say unless this these proteins are made into the cut into smaller sizes the virus particles may not develop so only when the viral particle is fully assembled then it is released and goes and infects more so if you can stop at this level okay you have not prevented infection but this is arresting the for the development protease inhibitor and now the latest drugs are there this the ccr inhibitors the chemokine receptor inhibitor as i said first the uh, cd4 receptors and then cc5 receptors chemokine receptors core receptors so there are drugs now for the prevention of the core receptors now developed actually the stage of attaching itself is prevention and then attachment receptors are also CD4 receptors are also their drugs are being under research. So, so many areas you can see all these areas. Each area they got a drugs, antiretroviral drugs, all to prevent spread because all these are only virus statics only. There is no virus idle drugs at all. With this understanding of the knowledge, now I go to the next slide. You need not remember all the names, but just have an idea. There are so many antiretroviral drugs are there. They are grouped under various categories. The first and foremost is nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. NRTIs means nucleoside reverse transcriptase. It's most important thing. It's stored ones are all most commonly used one. Zidovidin, all of you must be familiar. And it is short named as AZT someplace or ZDV. Both are shortcuts for the Zidovidin. And efavirenz, the name is not ending with the diidine. It's the only one if uh, NRTI, which is not ending with the diene, diene, So, lamubidin 3TC, it is a uh, short name is lamubidin. You remember this, zidovidin, lamubidin, and ifavarin, the three drugs most commonly used in this, sometimes tavidin. The second category is non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. It is, not, it is also inhibits reverse transcriptase, but not related to the nucleoside category. Example, nevirapine. This is a NR, nevirapine is the one we used in the parent to child mother transmission, MTCT, FPPCTCT. And delavadin is the one thing actually. The third category is protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors is at the time of assembly of the protein, as I said, you know, all these are ending with the vir. That is a remember, sequinavir, rituanavir, nelfinavir, uh, navir, lopinavir. So those ending with the Never, never, never is an indication. Just remember one or two. The integrase inhibitors. This is the one where there is a uh, double stranded viral DNA is not is prevented from getting integrated with the host DNA. Uh, Raltegavir and Egaltavir. These are two examples with of recent development. These are this And then fusion inhibitors. At the time of that is at the time of attachment itself is indicated. The enfuvertide is a uh, one of the recent drugs. Enfuvertide. The nucleotide reverse transcription. This is a nucleoside. You know the difference is nucleotide is with the, including the phosphate molecule. It's called the nucleotide. So nucleotide reverse inhibitor is a tenofovir. One example is tenofovir. It is a, called as TDF. The shortcut is TDF. Tenofovir used in the antenatal also. And the last one is a chemokine receptor inhibitor. So I think Meraviroc Merav actually one drug is coming to the FDA approval. So this is a core receptors are there when the once the virus has attached, you know. So it prevents unless the core receptor also engaged, the virus cannot attach to the CD4 cells. So core receptor inhibitors are Merav Meraviroc. So these are the various variants of antiretroviral drugs. You need not remember all these things. Don't worry. So it best remember one or two important. Now, how to use this? So many drugs are there. All of you may be familiar with the heart. What is highly active antiretroviral therapy? Highly active antiretroviral therapy is because all of these drugs, none of them are uh, used alone because there is chances of viral, uh, there's a resistance development is very, very common. And after the tuberculosis, this is the one area you will never use single drug. This is always combination of drugs. So what is meant by heart is, a customized combination of different classes of medication because they should not be become the same type of drugs at all. So they should be acting in different mechanisms, drugs, uh, they, and they should be using medication based on how do you use them combination based on the medical, the viral load, 
So viral load is more, you use more number of drugs, less, less number of drugs, but combinations. Particular strain of virus, which type is a very resistant type, HIV-1 or 2, and the CD4 count, that is an indication of how much immunosuppression has occurred. So these are the factors resembling on them. And then the presentation of the disease symptoms. There's a multi, there's a disseminated tuberculosis or a localized tuberculosis, something like that, all these things. So based on this, you use this combination of drugs. So combination of ART, at least three drugs, at least two classes, at least from two classes. They can use two drugs from the same class also, no problem. But at least there must be two classes. And to prevent the immune function, to preserve the immune function and delay disease progression. They only delay disease progression. The duck combinations are most initial therapy. Most often, this is the combination is two NRTIs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase, and plus one NRTI or plus one protease inhibitors. Either this or this, two combinations are there. this or this. So these are the common combinations we are using. Two, but always NRTIs are two standard, always there. Only thing is changing drug is one NNRTI or one PI, only one of them. So this much is enough for undergraduates. Thank you, thank you very much. So any questions? It's a little long, let's say, do you agree? Okay, guys. No questions, I stop it here, okay? Yes, sir.